Okay, everyone, um, we're just going to take a minute and show you a quick little video because today is Giving Day at Jefferson. So let us just show you a little. So today's Giving, so today's giving Day at Jefferson, and 100% of the innovation pillar is in. We're filming today in this really cool space, the Jazz, which is funded by the Frederico family. And that's what giving is really all about. Everyone in the innovation pillar that made a contribution as an incentive got a lottery ticket. So we'll see where that goes because we're all in. Every day at Jefferson, we change lives, and that's why I'm in. Okay, so for those of you, who, who, is there anybody here that didn't know that it was Giving Day today? Okay, so now you know. <laughs> so there's, there's really fun, cool stuff, and what they're looking for is, for it, it's not about the amount, it's about that you care enough to give a couple of bucks. Yeah, so. so if you haven't, urge you to find one of the places that, I mean, there's like food and music and cool stuff oh, out in front of 925 um, over on Lubert Plaza. So anyone who um, feels like they're part of this community and feels like they would give a little back, today would be a nice day to do it. Um, Steve Clasco is committed to giving $50,000 if we break 1,000 donors. So, um, and we're well on our way. So if you want to help match that by, even if it's a couple of bucks, it's about being a giver, it's not about how much. So, um, so that's my little pitch for stepping it up. And talking about stepping it up, I mean, you can't step it up anymore than with the amazing <laughs> Julia Haller. Yay! Thank you. Thank you. So Julia's gonna talk to us about what amazing stuff goes on right across the street at Will's Eye, which consistently gets ranked as one of the world's top eye institutes. Is it number one or two in the world now? Uh, two. Two. Yeah. Yeah, we'll take it. Well, number one in residency. I, I'll be talking about that a little bit, too. So, mm -hmm. so th this, is, this is one of the great things mm -hmm. about being here, being here at Jefferson, being here in Philadelphia. You know, sometimes we forget the, the you know, it's almost an embarrassment of healthcare riches. And at Jefferson, we're especially gifted and blessed with a lot of really cool stuff. Um, the things that are going on at Will's are pretty astonishing. So Julia will give us her view, and yes, it is a play on words, into the future at Will's. <laughs> Julia Howard, Chief, see, Chief Ophthalmologist in Chief of Will's Eye. Thank you. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here and to introduce you to Will's Eye Hospital, for, which for some of you needs no introduction, uh, as well as into innovation and ophthalmology. So we'll start off with a little intro to Will's. Step inside and you can feel it. The deep sense of pride and purpose that comes with more than a century of being first. The towering expectations of your colleagues your patients, and the world. The relentless hunger it takes to fight on the front lines of a cure. At Will's Eye Hospital, it's easy to sense all the emotion, the history, the victories. And when you feel the past leading the future, when the team makes the patient the priority, and collaboration drives success, when residents and long-standing chiefs have the same lofty goal, when this is your rally cry, medicine wins the day. You dare to believe that there is no eye condition or disease too rare or complex to be defeated. And when you dare to believe, the unbelievable happens. Sight is restored. You see hope in the face of hereditary disease and deterioration is replaced with determination. When you look through the lens of possibility, anything is possible. 
Because here, believing is seeing. Thank you. So believing is seeing. We hope that tagline captures a little bit of the inspiration and determination and excitement that we feel every day when we walk into the building across the street. This is a little collage of all the four buildings uh, that Wells Eye Hospital has occupied. As the nation's first eye hospital, we opened originally with a gift from the Quaker merchant James Wills in 1832 on Logan Circle. So here's our first building. Our second building was on Spring Garden Street, and then we moved in, across the street to Ninth and Walnut, uh, into which was Will's Eye Hospital until uh, the early 2000s, till 2002, when we moved into our current building. So uh, this place is absolutely unique, uh, the gift of, of, of a merchant to the city of Philadelphia. We belong to all the citizens of Philadelphia. And since 1972, we have served as the Department of Ophthalmology for Thomas Jefferson University. And it's been uh, something that we're proud of, that for all years of the US News and World Report poll, we've been in the top three in the country. Uh, for the last five, we've moved into number two, and we're very close to moving to number one. Stay tuned uh, this summer for the, for the rankings. Uh, this year, for the first year, Doximity ranked ophthalmology residency programs, and we were very proud that the Will's Eye at Jefferson ophthalmology program ranked number one in the country. We believe that after 187 years, we remain true to our original motto, which is delivering medical care with skill, with compassion. It's a particular pleasure to be here today because Jefferson has been such a wonderful partner uh, in our innovative efforts. And I'm going to touch on those very briefly today because there's so much to talk about. So each individual topic will, you, you may feel you're just beginning to understand what I'm talking about and I'll move on to the next, but it gives you an opportunity at least to look into some of the things you might be interested in to delving in further. One of the reasons uh, ophthalmology is the top specialty in all of medicine is because of the exciting and revolutionary changes that have occurred uh, over the last 10 to 20 years. And I'd like to pick three of those in my discussion today. And that, again, this will just be touching the surface. So I'm going to be talking about technologic innovation, pharmacologic innovation, and then the whole new world of genetics and how that impacts on ophthalmology, as of course it does on medicine as a whole. So what are we talking about with technology? There are a host uh, of different ways that technology impacts on our ability to diagnose and treat the eye. For those who have forgotten a little bit of their fourth grade cow eye dissection details, uh, I want to start off with how the eye works. So the way we see is that light comes in through the clear front part of the eye called the cornea. It then traverses the anterior chamber and goes through the pupil, which is the opening in the iris. And then it is focused by the lens of the eye. So here's the lens, which sits right behind the pupil. As the lens gets older, it becomes denser and more opaque. And many of you all may know people who've had cataract surgery. The, the cataract is the dense lens, which at, when it finally becomes so dense that you can't see through it, can be replaced. And that's actually one of the most successful surgical procedures done in the human body. Modern cataract surgery was developed by a Wills graduate, Charles Kelman, who developed phaco emulsification. And the, uh, an artificial lens implant, clear lens implant, is then placed where the original lens was. So now light is get, getting focused by the lens. It goes across the vitreous gel and then focuses on the retina. And this is the retina lining the back of the eye. We use the analogy that it is like film in a camera. That analogy is somewhat outdated now, though, since very, how many people here have ever put film in a camera? OK, just the front of the room. <laughs> now, the, the key, a very key part of the retina is the macula, and I'm looking to, oh yeah, this shows up even with the light from the side. So this little down dip here, and, and with the fovea in the center, this little down dip here is called the macula. And the macula is your central vision. If you think of your visual field as a bullseye, the macula is in the, in the bullseye. And that's what, when I'm looking at people's faces, I'm using my macula, although I can see everything out here to the side as well. 
So over a million photoreceptors here in the retina picking up light impulses, generating a little electrical signal that is then sent, then sent through connecting nerves to a nerve bundle called the optic nerve with over a million nerve fibers in it that goes up to the brain and then your brain tells you what you're seeing. So that's a, a quick uh, review of uh, the visual system. Now in order to image uh, the eye, and the visual system. We've developed a lot of different instruments over the years, and I wanted to go briefly, just mention briefly some of the ones you may have seen, like a slit lamp biomicroscope, which enables us to take little sections through the eye with a light and, and, and see details like this corneal scar. In the back of the eye, um, we have instruments that date back in time, the ophthalmoscope seen here, the indirect ophthalmoscope, but it is the new technology that I'd like to focus on that has enabled us to really up our game in terms of diagnosis. And I would pick out amongst the many different types of, of uh, technical uh, new innovations that we have, optical coherence tomography in particular. So here is an optical, an OCT machine. You see the patient putting his chin down here. And the machine then bounces light off the back of the eye. The light bounces back into the computer, which reformats the information into cross-sectional slices through the retina, very high resolution slice, slices. So here we see the picture that I showed you before. You'll remember this little down dip was the macula. When we take a color photo of it, we can see it in 2D, but look at this incredible third dimensional view that we've got right through the central macula. And we can see all the layers of the retina tightly compacted. We can see that it's sitting on this basement membrane on the wall of the eye. And we can also tell things about the vitreous gel as well. So this has been a remarkable innovation. We use it for looking at the optic nerve, all the structures in the back of the eye. The, this enables us, for example, to diagnose very early diseases like macular degeneration, the number one most common cause of blindness in the, in the developed world in people over the age of 50. So here we see a normal macula here. In the back, can you see these little yellowish deposits here that have formed? This is somebody who is developing macular degeneration, which is divided into dry, the milder form seen here, and wet. So in this particular patient, we see that this normal macula has been changed by these deposits on the basement membrane of the retina called drusen, which are the hallmark of dry macular degeneration. Now we don't see any, any suggestion of wet macular degeneration here. In wet macular degeneration, which is the most blinding form of the disease, patients develop leakage, new blood vessels, hemorrhaging, and fluid here in the back of the eye. So here we can see drusen. Here we see a patient with wet macular degeneration. So this patient has gone from drusen to hemorrhage from these large deposits underneath the retina, which are still dry macular degeneration, to severe blood underneath the retina. And we can see fluid here underneath the retina, this fluid underneath the retina, uh, within the retinal tissue. And this situation gradually evolves into a large scar, and the scar tissue completely replaces all of the macular function. So when patients look out, they're completely blind centrally and only have peripheral vision. The OCT has enabled us to diagnose even the earliest stages of this disease and also give patients an idea about how they're doing, progress, uh, in terms of uh, progression of the disease versus stability of the disease. And also, because we now have ways to treat the wet form of macular degeneration, catch it at its earlier st earliest stage when vision can be preserved. So for example, this is a patient of mine who was seen in October with these drusen and macular degeneration. She has a little bit of difficulty seeing without bright light and magnification, but she's doing really well. She can read the paper still. And she didn't notice anything, but a machine that she has at home, which helps monitor her vision, picked up a little change. And when she came in, she had the very slightest suggestion that this area here where the drusen were, were now developing some abnormal new blood vessels, which were leaking, because we can see these clear little pockets of fluid here. 
Can you guys see those? So there's been a tiny, tiny change. She has developed the earliest sign of wet macular degeneration, and we're able to hold on to her vision by treating her. And I'm going to talk about the treatment in just a minute when I get into pharmacology. So that's been exciting. Um, in addition to the many new diagnostic technologies we have, surgical treatment has also evolved tremendously. And that includes uh, our microscopes. That includes the technology for doing micro-incisional surgery. Here you see diagrams of retinal procedures being done. These are procedures where we almost scuba dive into the back of the eye using, uh, using fiber optics and tiny, tiny little incisions, literally the size of 25-gauge needles, 27-gauge needles. This is micro-instrumentation. Here you see removing a hemorrhage in the back of the eye. Here, repairing a retinal detachment, and I'll show a little video clip in a minute uh, where you'll see the instrumentation. But we're able to go in and out without suturing in many cases, and uh, the recovery time is just remarkably uh, improved compared the, to what it used to be in the old days. Also, different types of laser technology are now available. Many of you may have, have had LASIK uh, procedure, or other procedures which can reshape the surface of the eye. We also, of course, use lasers. Ophthalmology is one of the first specialties to use lasers. Uh, it, it's, it's been at the cutting edge of, of many types of surgical procedures. Here's a head-mounted laser, the sort that we would use, for example, in the neonatal intensive care unit to treat children with retinopathy of prematurity. This is, the, this is my picture, actually, you probably recognize me, uh, from an article on light that was in National Geographic a few years ago. We're very excited at Wills to have gotten a million dollar grant from the Mesey Foundation, which is being supplemented by uh, other gifts from donors and, and also our, our Wills Eye family to build the Mesey Ophthalmic Surgical Training, or the MOST Laboratory. We think that's the appropriate name, you know, number one residency, MOST Laboratory. But this is going to be in a very exciting facility where we can practice um, with a lot of the new equipment and technology that's coming out. And you see here in the back some of the simulation. You can actually do simulated cataract and retinal surgery uh, now before you go into the actual patient. And with so many new devices being developed, it's incumbent upon us to have a place not only where our residents can, can learn new technologies, but the people who've been in practice can learn new te technologies. One of the areas where this is increasingly important is in glaucoma. Uh, because of the minimally invasive glaucoma surgery revolution, yet another revolution in these revolutionary times. So to draw back for a moment um, and remind you about glaucoma, glaucoma is a disease where elevated pressure in the eye causes damage to nerve fibers which feed into the optic nerve, and people lose their vision gradually from the side until they go completely blind, one of the major causes of blindness in the world. When we look into the eye, we can often suspect that somebody may be developing glaucoma because of changes in their optic nerve. So here's the optic nerve. Remember, that's where over a million nerve fibers feed into this tract that goes back to your brain. And the optic nerve head, when we look at it, is composed of the actual nerve tissue around the edge and a little cup in the middle where the arteries and veins come into and out of the eye. So the cup should measure about a third or less of, of that whole uh, area of the eye, uh, of the optic nerve. When it starts to get larger, we worry that glaucoma may be damaging the optic nerve and the nerve fiber getting thinner and thinner. So here, for example, is a patient who has glaucoma damage. And can you appreciate that this nerve fiber has gotten thinner and thinner, so the cup has gotten larger and larger in the eye? That's one of the ways when we do screening exams, we can tell if people are at risk for glaucoma or might have glaucoma, or glaucoma suspects. And when we do visual field tests, we see that these black areas where the visual field is being destroyed are getting larger and larger, and the actual visual field is getting smaller and smaller, and that is the disease of glaucoma. The treatment for glaucoma is to reduce intraocular pressure. And the options for doing that are medications, drops, laser, and surgery. Now, surgery has been relatively invasive in the past. It's involved actually drilling a hole, so to speak, making uh, an additional hole in the wall of the eye so fluid can flow out, or in, instilling a, um, a pipe. This is a sort of a plumbing thing where you're actually putting a tube into the eye 
which then runs out and into a reservoir, which is implanted in the, in the back of the eye, on the wall of the eye. And uh, these procedures um, are good, and many people have had them very successfully, but they're not as good as they could be. And that's one of the reasons we're excited about the minimally invasive or microincisional micro glaucoma surgery, or MIGS, hoping to be able to reduce risk, shorten the recovery time for these patients, and also get better, more predictable outcomes with little bits of, of surgery at a time. There are uh, many, many different uh, companies who are moving into this field. Uh, you can see the, the type of, uh, of uh, devices that are being developed. Here's one on a penny. Here's the Glauco stent, uh, which is put in to the eye inserting this small tube to bypass the eye's clogged drainage channels, which are called the trabecular meshwork. And here you can see a tiny, tiny little uh, MIGS, in this little eye stent in this eye. Wills has been very involved in the development of these technologies and in testing these technologies. We tend to be the go-to place that companies come to to test them. And here is a graph showing some work that Jay Katz did uh, with his group in the glaucoma service. Here's the pressure in these patients, and you can see dramatic drop in pressure, which lasted uh, over time in patients treated with this eye stent. Um, other stents have shunts to other parts of the eye wall. This is a suprachoroidal uh, shunt that's been developed. Here's a side pass, and I'm going to run through these, just to give you an idea of the host of different ones that are being developed, different ways of delivering them, different places they go to in, in the wall of the eye. This is the in-focus micro shunt. And if you look at some of the new glaucoma devices and procedures that have been developed in the last few years, you'll see there is a long list by a host of different companies all seeking to unclog uh, this drainage channel. So it's an exciting time in terms of technology. And that's just a tiny little glimpse of, of some of the uh, main areas where, the, where uh, we've been very influential in helping develop uh, these, these new approaches to, to treating patients with blinding disease. How about pharmacology? Pharmacology has been incredibly exciting. And I'm going to just talk about one area that's important to me because I'm a retina specialist. So if we look back 50 years ago, and, and uh, everybody's now learned about dry macular degeneration developing into hemorrhagic wet macular degeneration. About 50 years ago, Dr. Judah Folkman, who's a famous pediatric surgeon at Boston Children's Hospital, said, what is it, what substance is it that makes abnormal new blood vessels develop in the body? Why does the, uh, the body go from this to this? There must be something that's triggering it. And that thought uh, triggered a whole new area of angiogenesis research, trying to figure out what it is that makes new blood vessels develop in the body. His interest was mainly from the oncology side, because uh, what had been observed was that for tumors to grow, they had to be able to call in blood vessels. But his research was actually done in the eye, because the eye turned out to be a great model for this. So the early strides in the work that has led to many new treatments now, not only in ophthalmology, but also in, in medicine, and particularly oncology, came from the eye. It was in 1989 that vascular endothelial growth factor was discovered, or VEGF. It was discovered in two places by Napoleon Ferrara, who was at Genentech, which made the first drug for this. And he called it vascular endothelial growth factor. A guy named Dvorak at um, Harvard Medical School discovered it about the same time. And he called it vasopermeability factor, because it also made blood vessels leak as well as grow. VEGF is what we call it now. And we uh, understand it better, because we are, as a result of all this work, we understand the whole angiogenic cascade. So how do new blood vessels develop? Here you have a normal blood vessel. And it's going to start developing new blood vessels. It's going to sprout new blood vessels. So first, the endothelial cells get activated. Then the basement membrane starts to degrade in this little spot. Then endothelial cells start to proliferate and migrate. Then a little tube starts to form. This is the little sprig forming. And then the tube elongates and remodels. And before you know it, you've got a new blood vessel. It turns out that at every step of that process, VEGF is a key mediator. 
And we see uh, here a cell with a nucleus, and these are the VEGF receptors. VEGF binds to those receptors, activates them, there's signal transduction into the nucleus with gene expression producing angiogenesis and vascular leakage. It was Genentech then, which was able to identify this substance and clone it, that produced the first anti-VEGF drugs, which were actually antibodies to vascular endothelial growth factor. The first being Avastin, the full antibody, which is used for bowel cancer, and Lucentis, which is a modified fragment of uh, Avastin, which was the first drug approved for use in macular degeneration. Later, Regeneron developed Idalia, which blocks the receptor rather than the VEGF itself. And these drugs have transformed our ability to hold on uh, to vision in patients with macular degeneration and also in diabetic retinopathy, which is a disease that also affects blood vessels in the eye, causing new blood vessels and leakage. So now people, like the lady I showed you just a little bit ago whose disease was picked up very early, can hold on to their vision um, and don't need to go blind for macular degeneration. This patient is blind. The problem with these drugs is that they have to be given relatively frequently. So we now have uh, patients who come in every month or two for injections, and one of the exciting new areas of development is coming up with technologies that allow us to give longer acting drugs or put reservoirs in the eye. This, this is a little reservoir that Carl Regilla at Wills Eye Hospital was the principal investigator on developing. This little reservoir is put in in a very minor procedure and then can be re reloaded uh, in the office. So this is a little needle reloading uh, this device which, is, which releases Lucentis for months and months and months and months. So a patient gets a steady, constant delivery of the drug, comes in the office and gets their tank refilled, so to speak, and then can go back home rather than coming back all the time. <clears throat> Here is an eye with very severe diabetic retinopathy. Um, I don't, because of the light, you may not be able to see this, but abnormal new blood vessels are developing here. There's some hemorrhages here. And you can see the huge amount of leakage of protein and cholesterol from these blood vessels into the retina. This retina is very thickened, and this patient can't, can't read. This patient's legally blind in this eye. With injections of anti-VEGF drugs, over the course of some months, this patient rolls back the clock in their diabetic disease, which we thought, we thought it couldn't happen. We thought once you had this much disease, maybe you could make it better, but you would never get back vision. But, it, but in fact, that's not true. We're able to actually turn back the clock, and this patient can now read the paper. Other drugs that uh, work for, uh, disease, for diabetic retinopathy include steroids as well. And over the last 10 years, we've developed for example, uh, Ozerdec, this is a long-acting dexamethasone delivery system, and Alluvian, a long-acting fluosinolone delivery system. These are tiny little bio implants that are put into the eye and slow deliver steroids for months and months and months, treating diabetic retinopathy as well. Next, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, genetics, because genetics has uh, transformed our understanding of, of genes <laughs> and uh, our ability to, to diagnose and treat diseases has dramatically changed um, in just in the last 10 years. And here again, uh, Wills has been at the tip of the spear, and ophthalmology has been at the tip of the spear. So the first drug to treat an inherited disorder in medicine is in the eye. Uh, this was developed by Spark Therapeutics, uh, and it's Luxturna, a disease to treat a blinding disorder called Labor's uh, amaurosis that blinds people from the age of uh, child, starting in, in childhood. And here we have the historic FDA meeting, here's the panel here, where 14 to zero, uh, they approved Luxterna for, uh, for use in humans. And everybody probably has already seen me prominently displayed right there. I, I was one of the three surgeons in the trial, uh, inspirational, process uh, and just the beginning of what we're going to be able to do. Here are some of the articles on many of the new eye, and this is just in the eye, gene therapies uh, for blinding eye diseases. Here you see uh, Mark Moster pictured in one of the recent ophthalmology throwaways speaking 
on a clinical trial for a drug to treat an optic nerve disease at the American Academy of Ophthalmology, of our, of our uh, neuro ophthalmology service. Wills has been very involved not only in the development and testing of these drugs, uh, but also in the delivery. So one of the keys for all of these treatments is how do you get it into the eye? Uh, it's not a trivial thing. And uh, here we see Alan Ho working with Regenex Pharmaceuticals on developing a procedure to deliver this exciting treatment. So here's small gauge retinal surgery. See these little 25 gauge incisions in the eye? Here is a 25 gauge vitrector taking out the vitreous gel. And uh, you may have noticed that this patient has macular degeneration. This is a 41 gauge cannula. And I don't know how well you can see the little bleb. You see a little blister in the retina? He is injecting this drug underneath the retina that has a viral vector connected to the mRNA that encodes for an anti-VEGF drug. So this material injected underneath the retina will be taken up by the retina, and this eye will produce its own drug. So this eye with macular degeneration now can produce a drug to treat its own macular degeneration. How cool is that? Now this is still in phase one, two testing. Here is uh, another type of delivery system. Again, this is um, some, some work that Alan Ho has done. Can you see that bleb? So this is, instead of going into the vitreous cavity and injecting on the retina, this is going down the eye wall and injecting it up underneath the retina. And here is a 3D quantitative interoperative OCT. This is an optical coherence tomography system guiding this suprachoroidal to subretinal delivery system. With gene therapy uh, and, and um, with the development of these technologies, hand in hand is marching research on stem cell therapy because we need to deliver in, in eyes that have loss of the capability to see from, from these retinal cells, which cannot be replaced uh, by the body. Um, we're going to have to replace them with stem cells if we, if we want to get vision back. <clears throat> so. Um, a lot of work is being done on stem cell therapy, and it, it's gotten in the news a lot. Uh, we, we aren't where we need to be. We're still some years away. Although we have active studies testing these types of devices and these types of delivery systems, there, there are some areas where stem cell therapy is working in the eye. So for example, in this eye that has a severe burn, can you, can you see that this cornea is completely cloudy, so blood vessels and scar tissue have completely grown across this eye. A patient cannot see at all. This patient has had stem cells from the other eye, uh, which uh, the eye naturally has stem cells here at the limbus, which can replenish the cornea. So in this particular type of stem cell, transplantation from the other eye, or in some cases from, from other people, can replace uh, the corneal tissue, and, and you can see now the patient's got a completely clear cornea, I can see. More complicated, however, is the use of stem cells for the retina, just like it's more complicated for the brain and, and the spinal cord, which are basically the, the back part of the retina. So, so stem cells, as, as the New York Times article says, uh, plenty of hope, but halting progress. This is an eye with a large area of missing retina, and this is the type of eye that we are treating with some of the new stem cell uh, recipes. Uh, there are unscrupulous people that you may have read about in the paper. Uh, taking like fat from people's thighs and injecting it to the eye in malls in Florida. Uh, it's unbelievable, but true. Here, here's an eye. Look at all this horrible hemorrhage. This is an eye blinded with that type of unscrupulous therapy. So uh, as with so many things, the buyer needs to beware. Here is uh, Biotime, one of the companies at the forefront of, of some of the research for this. Uh, this is some work uh, that we've been helping with too. If you look at this OCT, you'll notice that there are no photoreceptors here. Here, with the, helped by the blue arrows, you may see that these stem cells have been implanted underneath the retina and seem to be surviving, at least in, in, some, in some form. Uh, but we still are not able to, re to really bring back vision in patients, uh, but we're working on it. I think what this shows us is how important it is for surgeons to be working with the basic scientists and the design engineers, and, and Jefferson should be the perfect crucible for this type of work, because that's exactly what we've got here. Because to get these therapies and to develop them and then enable them to work and be delivered to the eye takes a real team effort. 
and this is um, something that we've been working with some folks in, in uh, California who are colleagues. Uh, this is a 3D printed matrix where the cells are put on it and then this ultra thin membrane is slid uh, underneath the retina, hopefully someday to be able to really replace vision there. Uh, we see robotics. This is um, something that Alan Ho has been working with, a company called Orbit Biomedical, uh, to develop a stable robotic arm to help with these very delicate procedures where literally a micron or two can make a huge difference. One of the uh, very exciting technologies that uh, has gotten a lot of publicity and that Wills has been very involved in, and I know I've been involved with, I, I did the most of these implants in the phase three study of the Argus um, chip implant is for people who are completely blind from retinitis pig pigmentosa, they can't tell if it's night or day, black blind, who wear uh, a glasses mounted camera that transmits images to a chip implanted on the surface of the retina. And this is one of the pioneers from Wills who's uh, particularly inspirational. And this is her story, Fran Fulton. My name is Fran Fulton. I live right here in Center City, Philadelphia, and I have retinitis pigmentosa. RP is something that you're born with, and it's a degeneration of your peripheral vision. If the eye's like a camera, an old style camera, there's a lens in the front and then film in the back. The film is the retina, the thin film. And in that film are vision cells, and those vision cells begin to die off over time. The past 25 years, when I really lost my functional sight, I've been in almost a constant state of loss and grief. Her sons, both sons have retinitis pigmentosa, and she was hoping that she could be a trailblazer and maybe do something for her sons. It was absolutely heartbreaking to learn that my children had RP. Very painful. It was very, very, very painful. But um, I didn't want that message to come across to my children. I never wanted them to think that life wasn't worth living, because it is worth living. You just do things differently, that's all. I'm Dr. Alan Ho, and I'm a retina surgeon at Will's Eye Hospital. We've been working on the Argus implant for patients that have been blinded from retinitis pigmentosa, a degenerative disease of the retina. In terms of what this means for, for ophthalmology, uh, this is a game changer. You know, this is the first time we've been able to actually take somebody who can't see and give them vision. I am really, really so grateful that Will's Eye is, is um, available to do this extraordinary, extraordinary, exciting procedure. So the surgery itself involves taking a piece of hardware, a microelectrode array, making incisions on the outside of the eye, placing it on the macula inside the eye, positioning it, and then closing the wounds that allow this device to go in. The genius of the surgery and the device is that once the hardware is placed inside of the eye, it communicates wirelessly with a camera hooked to the middle of a pair of sunglasses and to a processing unit that takes the image from the camera, downgrades your face, takes, minimizes the details and gets the shape to a processor, which then sends the downgraded information to the sunglasses and wirelessly transmit data and power to the electrode arrays to fire those arrays, those microelectrodes, that correspond to the edge of a door or to uh, something that you would navigate on the street. I look left to right, I see what says at the edge over there. Yeah. Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> that is awesome. Oh. Julie. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> what Argus has done for me is provide me with information that I can process. And I'm looking at the walls and I'm picking up other objects on the walls. This is a huge step in and of itself, but it's only part of the multi-pronged scientific effort that's going forward in terms of vision restoration and neuroprotection. I think 
right on the horizon now are a huge number of developments that will make great strides uh, for people who have visual challenges. I've been able to um, identify thresholds like a, a doorway. I've been able to, to find the two sides of a doorway and walk through it without hitting it. Elevators. I can see, uh, I can identify people in a room. No, I can't see their faces, but I can, I can see the image of where they are. Like anyone who sees just darkness, she's been limited. And this opportunity for her uh, and, and this technology has been, has been really transformational for her. Uh, I am hoping that, from my experience, people will be, you know, um, inspired to look into having the surgery for themselves so that more people with RP can, can quote unquote, see again. We recruited Leslie Hyman, who used to be here with me, in front of the Vicki and Jack Farber uh, Vision Research Center sign, uh, two years ago to help work on taking our research, the many, many different pieces of research that we have, and building a strategic plan. Uh, this is a slide from a presentation she gave in Palm Beach last week, showing just in the last year some of the really exciting work that's being done on so many different fronts at Wills, from glaucoma to uh, gene therapy to photodynamic therapy, tumors, uh, imaging. Uh, we really uh, are building a lot of infrastructure and also trying to cross uh, the street and work with Jefferson in many ways because so much of, of this is collaborative work. Our emphasis is on clinical translation and community-based research and that includes something I haven't talked about which is health disparities and access to care as well as clinical trials. Now, why is that important? Well, we have all these great new therapies, but if people don't have them <laughs> or don't even know they have the disease, then we're not going to be curing blindness and uh, preventing vision loss the way we need to be. One of our very successful efforts has been the Philadelphia Telemedicine Glaucoma Detection and Follow-Up Study, which has been funded uh, to the tune of millions of dollars by the CDC, and we're hoping to get uh, phase three of that. We'll, we'll find out in a, in a few months. In that study, we're addressing the problem we have with glaucoma. We know that it's one of the most common causes of blindness in the United States. And 50% of it is undiagnosed. So there are probably over 100,000 people in greater Philadelphia who have glaucoma and don't know it. One of the problems with the screenings that have been done is that you screen lots and lots of people and you only find a few who have the disorder. So this particular study looked at not only underserved populations with a higher risk of disease and worse access to care, but it also uh, looked at targeting populations of underserved individuals who had high risk of disease, high risk of failure to follow up, and a high risk of vision loss in our city, the largest poorest city, the largest poor city or the poorest large city, depending on how you want to look at it in the United States. So we partnered with primary care offices and federally qualified health centers in the city of Philadelphia. And uh, we looked at patients who were at particularly high risk of uh, disease. So these are patients, even though they had no prior diagnosed ocular condition at all, had had no recent eye exam, were African American, Hispanic, Latino, or Asian over the age of 40, Caucasians over 65, and any ethnicity over age 40 with diabetes and or a family history of glaucoma. So we targeted this, in the risk reward group, we tried to get these patients who were at the highest risk, and we found them. So out of the 906 subject screened, you'll see that 61% were targeted as having some abnormality and brought in for confirmatory exams, and we had very high rates of telemedically discovered disease that was then confirmed on exam, and those patients uh, were sent into care. Ongoing studies are looking at the effect of a social worker on intervention and keeping those patients in the healthcare system, the outcomes of the monitoring and treatment, and cost analyses. And this work forms the basis of a very exciting new initiative just started last week at the Klein Wellness Center. And this is through collaboration uh, with Jefferson and the Jefferson Philadelphia Collaboration for Health Equity looking at a sustainable model for, for eye care in that population of patients in, in North Philadelphia. 
Our aim is to make Philadelphia a land free from blindness with liberty and vision for all. As you can imagine, all of this work uh, ends up accumulating a huge amount of information. And analyzing that data is going to be the only way we're going to be able to take care of everybody we need to take care of them. So between our imaging, our telemedicine, uh, the data from the largest medical practice uh, in, in the eye world, uh, we are looking increasingly to be analyzing that data using artificial intelligence and machine learning. And when you look at innovation in ophthalmology, as in medicine in general, here again ophthalmology is at the tip of the spear. So ophthalmology is the first specialty to amalgamate all its patient records into terabytes of data. And we're pr very proud that Wills was one of the five academic studies centers chosen to analyze that data with the American Academy of Ophthalmology. I'm going to close uh, with one of the jewels in the crown of Wills, and indeed in the crown of, of uh, Jefferson Health, and that is ocular oncology. Here you see Drs. Carol and Jerry Shields, uh, who uh, with their team run ocular oncology at Wills, by far the largest and, and most well-known center for eye cancers in the world. I put this picture in because it, uh, although only taken a few years ago, it includes two people that we recently lost, Dr. William Tasman, my predecessor, and also, um, uh, let's see, here, well, we, so there's Jerry Shields, we haven't lost him, there's me, there's Alice Lee, <laughs> and here's Luther Brady, who many of you uh, may recognize, who we also lost last year, at Carl, Carol and uh, Bill Tasman. And Luther, as a uh, world famous ocular oncologist and radiation oncologist, helped develop many of the plaques and other therapies that were innovated here in Philadelphia at Wells to treat tumors like melanoma. So, the number one uh, most common ocular cancer is a melanoma. This is a choroidal melanoma. Here you see another one that's so large that you can see it through the pupil. You can also get melanomas in the, in the front of the eye. We treat about a third of the melanomas in the United States here and partner very closely with uh, Jefferson. In fact, the reason uveal melanoma has such a large center here at Jefferson is because of all the patients from Wills who've been coming here over the years. In children, retinoblastoma is the most common ocular tumor. And here you can see the way these kids are picked up at an early age. Their parents notice, they take a picture, one eye has a whitish, yellowish reflex. And of course, in many families, it can be inherited. And here we see a mother uh, who was treated years ago for retinoblastoma, and she survived. But you can see the r terrible radiation damage from the x-ray therapy that was the only treatment back in those days. And here her child also has an informant inherited form of uh, the disease. Retinoblastoma has been one of the fabulous and transformational areas where the treatment for this disease has totally changed. And a lot of that has been our partnership uh, with Jefferson, particularly neuroscience, and, and also for children who need chemotherapy uh, with Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Here you see two crucial members of the team that have innovated this fabulous therapy, which not only saves the child's life, but has been able to save the eye and also save some vision. And there's Pascal Jabour. He and his team in interventional neurosurgery put the child to sleep and then feed a tiny catheter up from the groin, up through the carotid artery into the ophthalmic artery. Here you see the little catheter in the ophthalmic artery. And here in real time is this being done. You can then, they, they then flush the eye with a super high dose of chemotherapy, a dose that would kill the child if given through a peripheral vein. But that extremely high dose goes directly into the eye and can kill the tumor. So here we see a child who's going blind from this large tumor which will metastasize and kill him. But instead, with this trans arterial catheter delivery of chemotherapy, the tumor is killed and you can see there's still a lot of good retina there for this child to see with for the rest of his life. You never want to hear that your kid has cancer. It's just the most life-crashing thing. There was a lot of a lot of unknowns, a lot of what ifs, a lot of really scary stuff going on all at the same time. It starts hitting home, it starts getting real in a hurry. We become very close with our patients because we're taking them through probably the darkest days of their lives. To come here and have people that know exactly what they're doing and know exactly what you're going through and tell you, we got this. We're gonna do this together. And at the end of this, she's gonna see and she's gonna live. And it's just amazing. 
Wills is one of the rare places in the world where across the entire spectrum, we have top experts in every field. It's like all the Heisman Trophy winners in the world are on the team. No matter where you go in the United States, they know about Wills Eye Hospital. On Mondays, we'll see anywhere from 40 to 50 new patients, all with terrible eye cancers or tumors that simulate a cancer. Wednesday, I have to be on top of my game because I deal with babies with eye cancer. And when I'm at bat with a baby with eye cancer, I gotta swing that bat so hard that it's a home run every time. Carol probably sees half the retinoblastoma as a childhood cancer of the eye in the United States, and we work with her very, very carefully. Ralph Eagle is probably the most critically important pathologist in terms of an eye program in this country. Is that a little fibrous metaplasia on the surface yeah, there? Yeah, it's up to 1.3 millimeters or something. Okay. Carol's absolutely excellent and magnificent as a physician and a surgeon. You don't find doctors any better than that anywhere as far as I'm concerned. Philadelphia is a very unique medical town. People come to Philadelphia for treatment from all over the world. Our reputation is international when it comes to healthcare. Incredible expertise in neurosurgery. The expertise of some of the top radiation oncologists. Dr. Sato is developing techniques that are really unique in treating metastatic melanoma. Trying to tackle the disease from every side is really important. We couldn't have done it without a team approach. Pascal Jabor at Jefferson Hospital has been absolutely instrumental in developing and improving our techniques of treating children with retinoblastoma and to give chemotherapy directly into the eye. We're saving lives of kids and saving vision. All working together for the best interest of the patients. There should be no boundaries. There is no other ophthalmology center in America that even comes near to Wills. We're on the brink of some big discoveries. Hopefully by the time I finish my career, the days of watching people die from ocular melanoma will be only dusty memories. When Dr. Shields, being all business, sits down across the room and smiles at you and says, your child's cancer free, there is no tumor, no regrowth of any sort, you cry. I honestly don't know where I would begin to say thank you. It'd be endless because I honestly feel this place is priceless. You put all your faith in them, and I thank God every day that there is a place like Will's Eye that can save children like they've saved Tatum for me. Thank you very much. Well, I don't know about the rest of you, but I, I'm like dabbing my eyes over here. <laughs> this is some of the most um, inspirational commentary and video and um, just what, what a great story you got going, Julia. You're Thank just you. making it happen very every proud day. Of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's like exciting times. It really it keeps is. us coming to work every day. Yeah. It's, it's great to get up and start the day when you're um, doing the, the, the kind of stuff that's so meaningful. There must be some questions, but um, I'm going to use the power of the microphone to ask one. Um, so backing up to macular degeneration, I remember reading somewhere about the use of proton therapy, and I think it is used for wet, not dry, if I remember right. And I'm just wondering, um, what, what's, the, what the, what's the relevance of that at all in the clinical picture? For, for macular degeneration. Uh, before we had um, good pharmacologic solutions, we tried a lot of things, uh, laser, uh, radiation therapy. There were, some, there were some little radiation, radioactive probes that we were putting in the eye, uh, you know, to try to stop, because those, are, those will kill new blood vessels too. But the problem is there's collateral damage to the nerve tissue. So we pretty much don't use that anymore. But proton uh, beams are used for, for tumors. So they're, they have a lot of potential for that. Okay, who else? 
Yes. Um, unbelievable. Thank you. Great presentation. So you talked about if you can find people that have undiagnosed disease, that's great. Um, the results that you had here in Philadelphia alone, but are insurance companies paying adequately for all of these things that are in fact approved and available? And that's an excellent question. And uh, the answer is that sometimes the insurance companies lag behind. <laughs> you know, one of the, um, the big efforts in medicine now is to get telemedical things paid for because screening, uh, the eye is uniquely suited to telemedicine because you can, you know, because we look out of it, we can also look into it. You saw a lot of the imaging. So we've really been working hard as a specialty to get some payment so that we can screen people uh, with photographs and things like that. With the, with the treatment, many of these drugs are extremely expensive. Lucentis costs $2,000 or so a shot. And um, there is a lot of work looking at cheaper ways to do that, to, to treat and insurance companies sometimes will make you use less uh, less uh, drugs that are less expensive, whether or not you want to use them, I don't know what, uh, before you can use other ones. So that, that's an ongoing challenge too. And, and uh, you know, we're working now with the University of Iowa to try to come up with some gene therapy solutions that will be affordable. As great as Luxterna is, created by Spark Therapeutics here in Philadelphia, the price tag for it's about eight hundred fifty thousand dollars. You know, not you don't. You're, we're not going to cure all the inherited retinal blindness in the world at that at that price tag. So, that's that's an ongoing challenge. Uh, Jay, Julie, hi. Hey. <laughs> Just like old times. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, uh, I there's no financial conflict here, but I've been in ophthalmology for forty years and I have never ever seen a finer program residency-wise than Will's Eye, and congratulations, Julia. Thank That's you, for and thanks for all your help with it. The, the second uh, piece is that follow up on that question uh, is the fact that uh, gene therapy, very, very exciting. Uh, just scratching the surface now is some very uh, orphan-type diseases. Novartis just recently said that their treatment for uh, spinal muscle atrophy, a one-time treatment, is going to cost $5 million. Yeah. $5 million. So how does a society afford that? I mean, I don't care about insurance companies or anything else. I mean, that just seems to be very daunting. And how does Wills position themselves to play in that game? Well, we're, so, I mean, you can't, you can't treat everybody with spinal muscle. I, um, my nephew married into a family that um, has spinal muscular atrophy in it, and SMA, and his wife's sisters lost two children. Well, that's ten million dollars right there. If they, you know, it wasn't available for that. But um, those are ethical. So that. You know, how much is a child's life worth? <laughs> $5 million. I, those are ethical questions that are uh, uh, ones I like to talk about over a glass of wine, but not here. But, but in terms of what we're doing, the, the reason we're working uh, so hard with the University of Iowa right now is that after putting hundreds of millions of dollars of research into developing gene therapy, we are almost at a point where each individual treatment would only be ten thousand dollars. So that is doable. You know, I think most of us could do that. And even if we had to pay for it ourselves, we could save up. So um, that's where we want to go because in our lifetimes we want to cure every disease that we possibly can. Uh, but that's going to take philanthropy to enable us to do it here at Wills too. But that that's so I we we want to find better ways to do it. So I think, anybody else before we wrap up? So ending on a philanthropic note, Julia, is the right place to be today on Giving Day. So those right. of you that haven't, Specify ophthalmology on your million dollar plan. Well, I think, I think you probably inspired some <laughs> gifts here. I mean, I, I, so please join me in thanking Dr. Julia Haller. Great. Thank you. And enjoy your sunglasses. <laughs>